first one is more of a factual question, which was, how was eliminating the long-form census the key to getting a majority government? Yeah. For Stephen Harper, all opposition is bad. There is no bad opposition quite like the facts. The facts get in the way of the agenda. And if you don't have independent fact gatherers, and think of it, almost every independent voice that we've had in our country, from federal scientists who've been muzzled, to deputy ministers, even to people gathering things that sound public policy has to be based on in Stats Canada, have been silenced one way or another. And that's why uh, Dimitri Soudis was so excited by the long form census, because it took away another one of those areas that was going to produce evidentiary, evidence-based reasons for not doing certain things. And a good example of that, where no facts were given for major change. Remember when Stephen Harper was in Davos, Switzerland, and he said he was going to change the OAS after promising he would never touch the pension system? He changed the OAS. The decision was released in another country. There was absolutely no debate in the House of Commons on something of fundamental importance to Canadians. And here's the killer. When Kevin Page heard the news, his word, he said, I was God's man. I immediately called the Deputy Minister of Finance and said, where's the white paper? Where's the documents that show that this had to be done and it was not sustainable at the OAS in its current form? And the guy said to him, there are no documents. And that allowed you to follow the agenda. And the agenda, let's face it, he's had no interest in making any changes to Canada pension except degrading it, just like Medicare. And that's why the long form census um, like the scientists who were finding out the impact of oil spills and fresh water in the Experimental Lakes area, were dangerous people to him and had to be silenced. And in the case of the ELA, he silenced them the best way he knew how. He shut them down completely. A world-class scientific facility. Um, I think there's going to be a great deal of interest in that issue because I happen to think a lot of people are so anxious to stop Stephen Harper. They're going to want to know who's winning in the riding. And they're going to especially want to know in that last crucial week. And I think there's going to be a lot of, of polling that's being done by all parties. And in fact, I know from the point of view of iPolitics, we're going to be doing daily polls. So you're going to have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And that it may not come down in the national polls to ridings, but the riding level people, the party people, will be doing rolling polls. And if I were you, I would uh, make a connection in the party of your choice and make sure you're aware of what's going on because it's so crucially important that no votes get wasted at this time. It's not that I can't answer, it's just that there's so many things that are going through my mind. <laughs> but no, I think ultimately people who are not watching politics under the microscope the way some people have to, um, who are in this business, I think they form general opinions about people. And I think probity, I know that sounds a little old fashioned, but probity counts for a lot. And I think that in 1992 or 93, Canadians came to the conclusion that Brian Mulroney was a liar. That the nickname Lion Brian covered off his approach, which was largely on everything, very few facts. And when Brian Mulroney realized that people no longer believed anything he said, he passed the poison chalice to Kim Campbell. They usually give it to a woman when it's hopeless. And, of course, they got white men. They got two seats. And um, I think what's going to take Stephen Harper down is in part what has just unfolded at the Mike Duffy trial, where we saw how corrupt the Prime Minister's office was, how completely scheming Nigel Wright and uh, people like Benjamin Perrin, the Prime Minister's lawyer, uh, Chris Woodcock, and all the advisors, they were trying to find out about a confidential forensic audit they had no business interfering in. They tried to rewrite Senate reports, and at the top of it all, I remember calling Duffy, and I said, Mikey, you know, what is behind all of this? Who is behind all of this? He said, this all goes back to the PM. This all came from him. And he said, Michael, I don't hate him. He just can't help us. So that's where I think it's going to come down for average people who are going to look at Stephen Harper, and they're going to say, I just don't believe you anymore. I don't think it'll come down to a particular issue, but it'll be that cumulative effect of, of years and years. In your view, how would you 
explain the program? That's very simple. The program is, I'm the boss, and you're the serf. Do what you're told. And it's interesting, I didn't mention this. Bill Casey's a brave guy. But when I asked for an interview for the book, he said, my God, my God I cannot teach you publicly. If I'm seen as a great Satan, that would be the end. <laughs> so guess where he met me? He met me at the West Wind Restaurant Irving Station, 10 miles outside of Amherst, where he lives. <laughs> I didn't have the trench coat up. <laughs> Was the PMO taken over apartment uh, by PM Dictate? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> what has happened is uh, all of our elements of governance have come down to the PMO and the Privy Council Office. There is not a decision made in the federal government that is not run through the Privy Council Office, which is the Prime Minister's department. The Office of Clerk of the Privy Council is no longer an independent office. He is now the Prime Minister's deputy minister. Um, and there is no question that Stephen Harper's view of government is he favors the U.S. system. He gave a speech in Montreal to a group of powerful Republicans uh, when he was out of the Reform Party and before he went after the Canadian Alliance in which he said that the Canadian system was essentially hopeless, that, uh, for example, he could not pick the best people from the corporate sector for his cabinet like he was president yet. He was stuck with the bozos who got elected. He's a person, he's a person who said that, you know, Canada is a, a Northern European welfare state and proud of it. He said that to the same group. And he said it's ludicrous to have a vote on everything after an election in Canada, because once you win the majority, the vote is always the same, you always win, so why bother? And that's what his view of Parliament is. Parliament has become a minor political obstacle to Stephen Harper, and the PMO has become um, a dictatorial power with no checks and balances. And that's something that Thomas Mulcair and Justin Trudeau have got to address. I saw recently that Trudeau said uh, his own father has started that process and that he disagreed with it. I think that's a step in the right direction. And I think Thomas Mulcair uh, made the same point with respect to C-51, um, which I think is something that, you know, I should have I mentioned C-51 and what I was saying is it's part of this whole, you know, police state creep that's going on in the country and no one's saying a great deal about the fact that nobody asked for C-51 in the policing community or the intelligence community. And since 2001, we've had eight pieces of legislation giving the police forces, the CSIS, the Border Service, uh, the intelligence listening posts. And we've given them powers they have not even exercised yet. So nobody asked for this. $12 billion has been spent on it. And Stephen Harper brings this in because basically he is a, he is a merchant of fear. And the best way to, to, to merchandise fear is to constantly make people believe that you need to be protected and I'm the guy who can do it. And here, here's the bottom line. All of us in this room in this country have a greater chance of being struck by a moose on the highway or hit by lightning than we do being killed in a terrorist event. And usually when you do threat assessment, the probabilities have to be taken into account. And the probabilities that he's talking about are, are in relation to the expenditures are ludicrously high. Just they, they just don't bear any confirmation. Can you explain why so many conservatives who are otherwise honest ethical people can be so uh, can so completely ignore the unethical actions of Stephen? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very anxious to see if they will this time. I have a funny feeling that that base is beginning to slip. I've been looking at the numbers pretty closely. Um, although I don't like to be enslaved to polls that are done 40 days before an election. But I do notice this. The base number has slipped to 27.5. The hardcore is supposed to be 30, and then he's supposed to pick up some 8% of the swing vote to get his majority government. But this time, it's going south. And um, there's trouble for the first time in the conservative campaign. I don't know if you saw the Peter Mansbridge interview. The Prime Minister looked very, very unsettled to me. He said some strange things. He said, if they get one more seat than me, I won't serve. He sounded like Jim Branches on election night in Alberta. <laughs> I'm out of here. And by the way, that had to be one of the one of the weirdest things I ever saw. Branches is coming back from the United States.
to call an austerity election in which he's telling Albertans he want to know what went wrong, look at the mirror, and along the way, he stops to buy himself a $70,000 1956 T-Bird. <laughs> and he drives away from the austerity announcement in his little baby. Well, under 377, any expenditure over $5,000 now has to be accounted for. So the cost for unions to administer their own business is going to become a deadly high factor. They're going to have to hire more people. Um, imagine if the Auditor General of Canada had to suddenly account for every $5,000 expenditure. It's a name meant to damage them uh, financially, and they're worried about it. Now, I have spent quite a bit of time uh, talking to the people at the CLC. One of the things they're worried about is dialogue. We have a silent Prime Minister. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't talk to the Premiers. Brian Mulroney had 14 First Ministers meetings in two terms he was Prime Minister. Stephen Harper has had none. Not one. And he doesn't speak to journalists. He doesn't speak to the union movement. The CLC used to have two to three meetings a year with both Brian Mulroney and Jean Chrétien. As Prime Minister Martin wasn't around long enough to see what he would have done, but I think it would have been the same thing. This Prime Minister does not speak to unions, period. And the first thing that came out of Lisa Ray's mouth when she met with the union guys from the CLC was, I am a member, a proud member of the Harper government and I support the Harper policies. Now, gentlemen, what do you have to say? So there's no discussion going on whatsoever. And I think to, to get to the bottom line of that question, um, I think what's going to happen is the next strike against unions is going to be making it easier for companies to, uh, to drop employees and make it, make it much easier in terms of separation payments. And I think you're going to see this, there's going to be a very interesting collective bargaining uh, thing between uh, the unions and General Motors um, this fall. And I think what you're going to see is the government will not allow the unions to use the strike weapon. And one of the things they've been doing constantly, um, whenever a strike, which is legal, and unions have the right to do it, um, whenever that happens, uh, he sends it into arbitration. And while it's in arbitration, he does the back to work legislation. So he has taken the strike weapon away, and I think that will be one of the next things that becomes obvious. If you were the leader of the NDP or the Liberal parties with their resources, what strategy would you employ to make Canadians realize um, the, what Stephen Harper really is and the dangers involved in reelecting him? I would do what the mainstream media has utterly failed to do, which is deal with the general. You know, it's turning people off. Yeah. All you have to do is look at what he's done. And I, I do not say this to boast. I'm one of the few people in the country who regularly reminds people. The old question used to be, is an incumbent deserving of re-election? And that necessitates a look at the record. I don't see those newspaper articles anymore. I see endless senseless spinning. Yeah. I see political panels filled with hacks from the parties. Yeah. I don't see that many journalists on. And I see obvious questions not being asked on those panels. One of the most obvious was not asked by, by Peter Manswick when the Prime Minister tried again to say only Mike Duffy and Nigel Wright are to blame. The direct question should have been this. Senator Irving Gerstein was ordered by your office to interfere in a private audit and in fact used an informant from inside Deloitte on a forensic audit. Tell me why he still has a job, because he knew about the $90,000 payment, and he never told you either. But that kind of question doesn't get asked anymore. And if you take a look at the TV stuff, most of the TV panels, they're like, they're like people at court. They don't operate for people anymore. They operate as part of an establishment. That the first past post system allows abuses and allows things like second million people's votes to count for nothing. There's only three countries left in the world who use first pass the votes for one of them, the United States and the UK. Everybody else has realized if you want a system where every vote counts, you have to have some form of proportional representation. You have to look at it. You can't do it senselessly, but you have to realize that it's not good enough 
when 36, 37, or 38% of the vote yield 100% of the power. 